Welcome to the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Shannon. And I'm Brenda. And this is a podcast where we highlight educators who innovate, engage, and inspire through the use of technology. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 37 of the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. How would you feel if you were a student and only heard about the things that you could improve? How would you feel if, instead, you found out about your strengths that are unique just to you? Are you interested in building up your students' self-esteem? Join us today as we look at Thrively with Judy Blakeney and Trisha G, where they help you discover your students' strengths instead of their weaknesses. Oh, by the way, after we recorded this interview, Trisha changed her name to Trisha G., so you will hear her introduced as Trisha Hien. But all of her contact information is correct on our show notes, and those are located on our website at mytechtoolbelt.com. So, without further ado, our interview with Judy Blakeney and Trisha G. Welcome to the My Tech Tool Belt podcast. Today we're so excited to have our guests, Judy Blakeney and Trisha Hyun with us today, and they are going to talk about strength-based EDU. Welcome. Welcome. So glad to be here. Thank you. So to just kick us off, we're not used to having two guests at a time. That's only happened a few times on the podcast. So uh, (laughs) we'll kind of navigate us through um, so nobody talks over each other. We'll start with Judy. Judy, would you mind just introducing yourself and uh, telling us a little bit about your background, and then we'll switch over to Tricia and do the same. Great. I'm Judy Blakeney. I'm I currently a middle school teacher at uh, Lisa Viejo Middle School, teaching career technical ed and also English to seventh graders. Coming off of a stint of three years as an instructional coach, working a lot of on uh, professional learning communities in my district. Outside of the district, I am very active in the Google sphere with uh, being a Google innovator and trainer. I got my innovator at Sydney in 2017 and with a focus on strength-based EDU as my project. And that's where I've been working a lot in the space with my dear friend, Dr. Trisha Hyun. Great segue. Okay. Trying to help. So (laughs) I guess I'm going next. Um, I'm Trisha Hyun and I work in the Fullerton School District. I have taught uh, eighth grade language arts and history. Plus now I'm teaching seventh grade language arts and AP Language and Composition. It's a pre-AP class. It's a pilot that our district is doing. Aside from my work day, I do some association work for CTA and the Institute for Teaching, which is a nonprofit that Judy and I will be mentioning later. I'm just very, very excited to be on this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. And for our listeners who don't know what CTA is, we're so used to acronyms in the education field, but I know we have some teachers that are new to education. So CTA is? Uh, The California Teachers Association. Perfect. So we're excited to have you guys talk about strengths-based education program that you've been working on. So tell us a little bit about, before you kind of tell us about it, what was driving you, what was the problem or the practice that was happening that was driving you towards looking into this more and researching more? When I first heard the word strength-based, I, as, as with anything in education, you have a lot of questions when you hear new concepts, new thoughts, new practices. And the minute I heard that it was talent-based, Of course, one of my questions was, well, why is it not called talent-based education? (laughs) But um, at the end of the day, it just, it made the most sense. Uh, At the time, I was teaching honors, and you have a classroom full of children who know how to read above grade level, they know how to write above grade level, and then where do you take them? So, of course, there was project-based learning coming down the pipeline, and a lot of choice voice and agency work that our own district, you know, currently is doing. And it just, it, it made all kinds of sense that as a, an umbrella concept to, to believe that every child has a genius, which is a Thrively's work. And again, we'll get to that next. But at the end of the day, to answer your question, it came from the fact that every day I walk into a room full of 35 kids who are all different. And when someone tells me that every single one of them has a talent and to focus on that talent is to believe in a strength-based education, uh, I'm sold. And so uh, right away, I 
we started to do some research, read some books, and uh, and then Judy and I propelled ourselves into strength based edu. Yes, so that strength based edu, as I mentioned, is my um, my Google Innovator project, and we have a website strengthbasededu.com that houses a lot of our work. But what we decided we did in in concert with our work with the Institute for Teaching, which is a five hundred one c three nonprofit of the California Teachers Association is um, both Trish and I have gotten grants. This is a grant giving organization. um, So it's not political at all in terms of the union, but each of us have explored using money we got from the grant, how to make that work. And so the idea is they're um, nurturing positive practices. The actual strength-based format is based on action research that the Institute for Teaching or IFT did maybe five, six, seven years ago. And there are seven factors, but uh, let's see if I can remember them all. The first one, student-centered, future-oriented, work-oriented, student relations, school community. So the idea is that you, in terms of the grants and then also our work, is you try to explore how to build um, a culture of success in a school with all of these seven factors. And all of the grants focus on, on implementing that as well. So mine um, in my that I've been implementing this year um, um, is about coding and preparing for the future coding and career-focused education. And then mine was a $5,000 individual grant. Krisha had a $20,000 grant last year. Why don't you mention a little bit about uh, what you so- my grant, and by the way, anyone who's listening can tap into teacherdrivenchange.org to read about these grants. Every grant awarded in all of California, there's a summary on the website at my school site with about two, actually it was a district grant. So four teachers, three classrooms, uh, building a strength-based culture wrapped around the seven factors that Judy talked about. And that's where Thrively came in. So we did uh, write a grant for Thrively, but just coincidentally, my district had purchased Thrively months prior to my writing the grant. And so I ended up getting to use the money on a lot of other uh, items that we needed to support the strength-based work. Okay, so Thrively is where you start. And what happens is when you go to Thrively.com, there is a free assessment that every child can take and adults can take it too. The only difference is that when you when you take it as, as an adult, you have to kind of pretend like you're your kid's self because some of the questions are wrapped around kid-centered and student-centered activities. So once they take the assessment that takes about 20 to 40 minutes depending on how fast a reader uh, you have taking the exam, Thrively will tell you they have an algorithm that figures out your top five strengths. So one way that this can drive your instruction is you can group students according to their strengths, or you can tell students, okay, we have, a, we have five analytical children in this room. And it looks like your team over here has a lot of creative skill, but you guys might need an analytical mind on your team. So there's a lot of grouping you can do with these strengths. And then there's like a host of other lessons and ways that you can use the data that Thrively gives to uh, not only the child, but also the classroom and the school at large as well. And even parents can have access mm-hmm. to, right? In my cl- school, in my grant, we got Thrively for the school-wide, and we just got it kind of introduced. And I think the next step would be to have a broader focus on SEL, s- social-emotional learning. So we really work on student strengths as opposed to deficits. And so I think that the key with the strength-based approach, and instead of looking at the broken things in a child or in a student of the deficits, the idea is really to start at their talents. And we, there's a, an acronym, TOSARS, talents, aspirations, strengths, opportunities, and results. So talents are what are innate, what you start with. And this kind of goes beyond Thrively, by the way. Aspirations are like, what are you going to do with those talents? How are you going to do it? And the next opportunities. And along that line, is it Daniel Pink that had the 10,000 hours or is it Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like that, the talents, aspirations, opportunities is how you build those into just possibilities into realities. How can I take this into the real world? How can I do something in life with it? And results is like, what did we actually do? 
Um, and so this kind of TOSAR's arc could be applied to many different learning frames, whether it's project-based learning, genius hour, but it's also moving a child from being reactive to being proactive to moving uh, not aware to metacognitive about who they are and how they can affect their, their life and build. So when, at what point of the school year do you typically do this, like the first week of school to find out what type of students you have or how does this work? So in our district, they started in the fifth grade. So not every child has to retake the test. So by seventh grade, a lot of us already have all the data uh, but if they want to retake the test, they can. Additionally, I just want to add to some, some of the topics that Judy brought up. Something Judy said reminded me of the fact that these talent assessments have really changed, for example, the way that we do an IEP or an SIT meeting for um, our special groups. Before, I've been, I've been at the same site for about 14 years. And when I was invited to an IEP meeting, why don't you explain what an IEP is? Individualized education plan. When I would go to these, it's almost like a round table meeting. And I actually think that our district does call them round table meetings where all the teachers come together to talk about one student and it might be about a problem. And so the idea is that once upon a time, these meetings tended to be more deficit based and wrapped around uh, the deficits that we, that we were seeing in the classroom that the child was was portraying or he was creating a problem. And, and what strength-based does is first, when you get to the roundtable meeting, you do talk about strengths. And if you can't come up with them right away because you have 200 kids on a daily basis, we have data that you can pull up that talks about what their strengths might be based on these questions that they answered. So then when you start at their talents and their strengths and move forward from that place, all of a sudden we have a roundtable meeting or an IEP meeting that goes from good to better to best versus starting at the bad or the deficits. So I was glad that she brought up the word deficit because definitely the biggest shift I've noticed is when we sit to talk about the problems in education. It's not really that we're talking about a problem anymore because, you know, problems and deficits are, are problems that sometimes can't get solved. They're just, they're that big, you know, take the problem of grading, for example. <laughs> um, so strength based is, is, is a complete shift in our thinking. I can see lots of ways just in the way you've described it. And, and really, this is my, probably my first time really uh, hearing about strength based education in just kind of a blended and personalized learning environment. By, I mean, you were talking earlier about the grouping opportunities. We typically see in blended learning and personalized learning when we group <laughs> for rotations, if we're doing station rotation. They're just they're either grouping homogeneously by understanding or heterogeneously by understanding, and so this might give them an opportunity, teachers an opportunity to group a little differently based on these other talents or skills or identifying factors that are kind of coming in as data. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we just see um, Thrively as a tool to kind of get the information. You can pay for it. Obviously, we got grants to do that. Um, and you get more, like teachers can have access to more information. Administrators can see all their kids. But they also have things that they can do within Thrively, like training uh, modules. And So I use that a little bit this year, not a lot. But I, um, the other thing I wanted to mention that I've used in terms of strength-based was digital portfolios with students. And so I don't know if you do this, Tricia, as well. I have two classes I taught this year. One was English to seventh graders. One was a career-focused class with seventh and eighth graders. Uh, in both of them, each student created a digital portfolio um, reflecting what their interests were, what they did. Some of it was process-oriented, like their work. And then some of it was reflective in terms of their growth and their goals. So this is another way to use a tool and not that you have to have a specific format, but with the goal of students documenting and reflecting on their work and then where they're going next. Like, for example, my seventh graders will go into eighth grade English next year. And a lot of the work we did in the second half was to prepare them for this, the models and the structure they use in eighth grade. 
And so they've already done it once. And then they also have a digital record of it. And when they forget everything over the summer, they can go back and, and see, oh yeah, I remember that. That's kind of an, another kind of a, a tool or a way to accentuate their strengths. Did you want to add something, Tricia? Yes, that Thrively has a digital portfolio within uh, the platform. And so although I did not require my students to have digital portfolios in the way that it sounds like you did, we did use digital portfolios across the school. And, and within that digital portfolio, there's some journaling that they do, some goal setting. And again, just really tapping into their talents and their strengths so that when they do decide, you know, for example, in a blended classroom, when they decide, what is my role in this podcast that we're creating? Uh, you know, uh, Shelly over there is doing a lot of the talking and she seems like she's the, um, the lead in, in the podcast and she's going to be talking a lot. So then the child might tap into their, um, their communication strength or their, their verbal strength. And they might open a Google Doc and start documenting for the team all of their work verbally or orally. And so, yes, on digital portfolios and yes, on archiving their thinking and what they're doing in the classroom for not only today, but so that they can look at it next year and say, you know what, I did this last year and here's the document and we can add to it. I love portfolios. I love the thought process behind them, the um, historical record that it keeps. It shows growth over time if you're doing it over multiple years. But I'm really interested in, and I'm, and I'm sorry I interrupted you, Judy, but I'm really interested in what would be an example of strengths that some of the students might see? How are, how are those identified to the teachers for when the student takes that assessment? So um, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this one. Um, last year when I had my grant, I had a student, and I'm going to change the name. His, his name is Fred. And Fred uh, was getting not only an F in my class, but also several other poor grades in other classes. And so I went up to him and I said, you know, progress reports are coming out. And if you can't get these grades up, if you're not going to do the work, uh, your progress report is going to show two, two Ds, an F. And he cut me off. And he said, I know, I know, I, I, if I don't do the work, I'm in trouble. And, and then I felt really bad for him. And I felt like this is not strength-based at all. So I said, Fred, let's focus on what you're good at. And he looked up at me wide-eyed and said, Thrively said, I have passion. And he said, Thrively said, I'm creative. And I said, yeah. And so what can we do with that? Let's go. Let's create a lesson. Let's figure this out. Well, when Judy and I presented that three or four months later at a parent evening, uh, we invited him and he was able to get extra credit enough to raise his grade by presenting at the parent evening about Thrively. <laughs> so one great thing about Thrively is that the ownership aspect of children having more self-efficacy and being able to propel themselves out of the bad place that they often feel when teachers remind them, you know, you're getting an F in my class. <laughs> so that's, that's my story about how we can propel them with their talents. Right. And so in that, I remember specifically how eloquent he was, how capable a seventh grader was to stand up in front of a room of 30 adults and present. And I'm not sure if it, we kind of saw that his strength was presenting or communicating to adults, but how affirming for someone who's not succeeding in traditional academic settings and structures, find a place where their strength can shine and then can have that feeling of success. So one, I'm going to step in here. One of the earliest strength um, connections I had was from Dr. Edward Hallowell, um, who's a psychologist at I think from Harvard, he's done a lot of ADHD books. Then one of his books is about the childhood roots of happiness. And it talks a lot about strength-based work, not in the same exact term, but it's, it's more about finding what you're good at, practicing it, having that feeling of positive um, experience, having an adult that affirms and, and supports you, and then continuing that cycle. I have a son who's had, um, has struggled in school, was in special education. 
So along the way, I was looking for an approach that would work in strength-based education as recommended by Dr. Edward Hallowell is, is one of the things that I've looked at as um, useful. I want to add to that, Judy. Uh, you're reminding me that Azusa Pacific University has their strength-based certification program. And the leaders who came out of the Azusa Pacific teacher program or the ed leadership program are working at Arcadia Unified School District. And in Arcadia, they have almost like a strength-based lab at their district office where 30 children, 30 junior high school children don't go to traditional school. And they have their, uh, to me, it looked like a strength-based lab. I'm not sure what they're calling that lab. Uh, However, they do have a summit called Arcadia Innovation Summit. Uh, and you can apply to present there. I just wanted to add to, to your research that this is, this is work that hopefully will uh, come off the ground and, and infiltrate all schools and districts nationwide. So, so tell us more about the ILC. So I'm going to start. I'm going to let Tricia um, add in too. So the ILC uh, is initials that stand for the Instructional Leadership Core. It's um, a, an organization that has a number of, a web of uh, sort of parentage, if you will, a scope, which is the Stanford Center for Opportunities Policy and Education, then also California Teachers Association. It's got a grant. So it has a, um, serious players and it really is the brainchild of Linda Darling Hammond, who has just left Stanford and now is the president of the California Department of Education. Mm-hmm. Um, And her vision is that teachers are the experts and teachers should be teaching teachers. So it's about teacher-led professional learning. The whole idea with the work is they're trying to uh, support it with grants and stipends for teachers like Trish and I are involved in a group. And we go out and we present uh, on a variety of topics. And there's a whole, I don't know, 300 of us in the state of California, maybe teachers that are involved in the ILC work um, and we provide free professional learning at a variety of locations wherever people need us. Some of it is strength-based, some of it might be what they're looking for, but we present often in this California Teachers Association Good Teaching Conference, there's a summer conference, new teachers conference, but at other locations as well or one-to-one with other teachers. And, and the whole idea is that using the capacity we have, none of us have money, some of us have time, but then we try to use the vision. And an example is now Trish and I, are in a, we were just two of us. And then last year we added other partners um, with three districts, Saddleback Valley Educators and Fullerton and Capistrano. And, and then in my district, we did a professional learning playground, um, which was where we had at the school as the union site, had people come in to present to other teachers and it's like a tabletop professional learning. You could come and go as you pleased. And it was such a hit. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the playground professional learning model. Have, is that something that's new to you or has you heard that before? Um, I've, I've heard that before. I don't know if no, Brenda I has, um, but I've, I get a lot of my stuff from Q, so I'm pretty, right. <laughs> pretty hip on those. But yeah, no, I like that. I like that model because it's, it's kind of an offshoot of like an ed camp where it's, I get what I need and if I, and I go where I need to go and nobody's feelings are hurt and you didn't commit to a session and have to sit through it the whole time. It's, it's a pretty cool model. So with those opportunities, and we'll list some of those in our show notes for our, our listeners, with those opportunities, are there online resources for that? Or is it a lot of it's just like the one the the I need to reach out to you guys to come and help me in my school? Or is there, I mean, I know Linda Darling Hammond has, <laughs> has her hands in many things that are all fantastic. Uh, and usually that comes with the website's uh, curated uh, resources and content. I'm going to go ahead and list them. Uh, Number one, the teacherdrivenchange.org website is where teachers can tap into $500,000 in grant monies. We have approximately 35 to 40% acceptance rate of grants per year. Teachers definitely need to tap into that resource. They can apply for anything and everything under the sun that is strength-based, which means child-centered talent-centered. 
Number two, the instructional leadership core. Yes, they can go to the website and find a list of the 300 teachers who are across California presenting on anything from NGSS to strength-based work. And those presenters, once a district or a teacher gets in touch with any of those presenters, they are those presenters who say, yes, I want to be at your school site talking to five teachers in a classroom or 35 teachers at a staff meeting. So those are those two resources, yes, are at instantaneous grasp online. And we have um, our own website, strengthbasededu.com, which kind of hosts some of the presentations that we've done at um, a variety of places. I'm kind of tailoring it to the need of the, the audience. And we've done a lot of digital portfolios, Google Sites, um, Thrively. Flipgrid also is another student voice forward organization that we've used and taught to teachers. Our group of six is staying in place. And then this, the instructional leadership core is winding down unless some more money comes in, I guess. In the final, this is the final year of it in uh, 2019, 2020. Um, but the idea is that you take all of these people, you model how to become instructional leaders in your community, and then people can kind of self-perpetuate or take root, if they use the metaphor, and have that flourishing of an educational and community. And they don't have to be based in California to participate in your group? It is um, California Teachers Association, so that's California. I'm not sure if we are presenting outside. Mostly it's within California. Once it goes outside of California, the California Teachers Association is heavily vested with the National Education Association, which is NEA. So if, if there are people outside of California listening, they can tap into NEA and get all kinds of resources that are very similar. Excellent. Great. So I'm a teacher. And I am listening to this podcast, and I'm I really want to assess my kids and my students and find out where their talents are and start using this information to personalize instruction for all of my kids, uh, just so that I can just help all of them succeed. I start where? What's my first step? Thrively.com, join, log in, and then that you can either email Judy or myself. Find us on Twitter. We will go and do a staff development for you on Thrively and uh, get you started. But really, any teacher could get started on their own in Thrively.com. Then if you go onto Thrively.com and you contact their administrator, you go to their about page and you contact Girish Venkat, who is the CEO and founder, or Jeff McConaughey, who is their chief education officer, they will email you back instantaneously because they're the kind of company, they don't want your business They want to be with you in education. They're not out to sell you anything. They're out to provide you with an opportunity to have every child know their talents, which is why it's a free assessment. So the the kids can go and get the assessments. The thing that costs is like having a classroom where you can manage it. I mean, you could have students take the free assessment and then have them share what their strengths are. And it's all web-based, so you don't need to download a program or anything you need a chromebook and then like maybe some earphones and, and what, what's space. the uh, the age range for these for the testing i think on the most part they do need to know how to read so it's really third fourth grade or second third fourth i they, they may have added a button now where you can press the, for the audio i know that in our district we start at fifth grade and you're you're in a k-8 and then fifth grade and sixth grade are in the elementary schools, and then you're a seven, eight middle school, right? So just knowing their model. So they can start by joining Thrively, getting some of the resources in the free version there, getting all their students online, taking the assessment. And then now that they have this information, they, have, they know all their students' strengths, what do they do with that information? One of the things I had them do, I had students write down like there's five top strengths. So I had them write in a three by five card. This is very simple, like anyone could do it. In the center, I wrote um, their top strength. And then in the corners, the next four strengths. And then on the back side, they would write their name. 
And then when we're looking to make groups or we're looking students to self-select groups, I could like start with here are all my analytical people or here are all my creative people. So they're all in different groups. And then I want you to come and pick groups based on the strength. And so it takes sort of the personality of kids out of it and honors who they are and what. That's neat. It makes it almost like a game. Like yeah. you're, you're picking that strength of different players and you can create this super team. Yeah. So I'm trying to give you an idea of like not spending any money in terms of doing it. Cause not everybody can right. spend money. I don't know what it costs from a classroom standpoint. If you want to have the ability to have classrooms like teachers and then school wide, then that that's a cost. And you can have individual teachers can have their classroom at a lower cost. Yes. as well. Yes, An individual classroom subscription to Thrively is $99 a year, according to their okay. website today. Okay. And okay. a school is $8.99 a year with asterisks. So yeah. asterisks is up to, you know, how many students, 30 students in an individual classroom and up to 250 in a school. Another activity that I remember doing is uh, directly going to Flipgrid and having every student say into the camera, uh, my name is Trisha and I have five talents and these are my talents. It's just empowering. Yeah. And keeping them, keeping that kind of at the forefront and then having a teacher actually honor that Mm -hmm. is, you know, I mean, I've sat in, I've sat in IEP meetings (laughs) and, uh, the ones I've sat in is like, well, you know, this kids, they're really, they're so sweet and so kind. And they do the sandwich, right? They do the like positive and then we're going to work on this. And then we close with, and then they're really sweet and kind. And, but they're not, they're not giving, you know, we're not giving the parents, you know, let's build on these or the, the teachers are not necessarily modifying what they're doing to capitalize and help the students succeed through their talents. And that's where I think kind of us pushing this information out to help teachers rethink. That's that's a lot of the work that we do at the university is help teachers rethink how they teach and how they assess, um, how they group and how they plan around student success. So that it's not just one lesson for everybody. Everybody writes this paper. Everybody gets graded on this rubric. And our kids that aren't strong writers or whatever, they might be videographers. And they, they're, ra- or, or, um, I have two, two children of my own, personally, who are um, spoken word poetry. Like, have gone into competitions. But they don't necessarily want to speak in front of people. But they'll do the spoken word poetry. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but they're capitalizing on their strengths, right? And so when they found a teacher who let them, instead of giving a presentation, do a spoken word, it, it blew everybody away, you know? And right. so that's why I you're, want to push teachers. You're reminding me that we had a new teacher. So the Fullerton School District, for the first time, gave two diplomas we not only gave the t- diploma that traditionally we give, but this year for the first time, we gave every student, every eighth grade student, a strengths certificate that not only listed their talents and their junior high school experiences that they enjoyed the most, but also the experiences that they want to have in high school, their dream colleges and their career aspirations. The, so we had all this data for the strengths certificates. The new teacher said to me, I needed that data at the beginning of the school year. <laughs> so what's interesting is nobody realizes we, we don't have a crystal ball. So we have no idea that a strengths assessment that you purchased two or three years ago is going to not only turn into a strengths, I'm sorry, a strengths assessment that you purchased three years ago is not only going to turn into a strengths certificate that they get in the eighth grade as they leave junior high school, but now it's going to start the school year for teachers with a, a, a host of data on their students. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's so powerful. You know, I can, mm-hmm. I can see where that would be so helpful. And so a couple questions just from the student's perspective, you've given an example about Fred name changed to protect the student who you were able to capitalize on helping him get some extra credit and helping <sighs> him thrive. What other what other impacts have you guys seen in the research and the work that you've been doing over the course of the last few years from a student perspective? I think part of it is for me, as, as Tricia said, it's I'm new at going back to the classroom this year and a new and so I'm still experimenting. Um, but I did have students do a TOSARS activity, my CTE classes, because it's really focused on 
work and work oriented ideas. And so I, I think just at um, having 13 to 14 year old students start to think about themselves in a broader context and be metacognitive um, and understand the connections of what I do today can affect where I'm going tomorrow and what my choices are um, is a tremendous gift to them. And, you know, we certainly see students are ready to, some of them are ready to be, to think metacognitively, are already there, but the others need sort of an on-ramp and an access to what are the, how do you break that down? And so what I did with all my CTE students, I think there's like 63, 64 in two classes, um, is to do a TOSAR's reflection in the middle of the year. So what are my talents? What are my opportunities? Um, what are my strengths that I've kind of structured up? What are my aspirations? What am I going to do with that? And then what are the results going to be? And then they added that to their digital portfolios. And my class was about two thirds eighth graders, one third seventh graders. Actual class I taught was sort of a technical investigation lab where they looked at a variety of different um, job opportunities. And as um, they did that, each module or each group they had to do a reflection page on their website. So after doing that reflection 10 times, you know, in terms of brain, they've myelinated their connections in their brain that, oh yeah, I can look at any job, any opportunity, you know, what, do this, what does it look like? What are the skills I need? What can I do with that? And what do I feel about it? You know, and for me, it wasn't about, even if they said, I have no interest in this. I was like, great. You can like put that one to the side. You don't have to worry about that. And it's kind of getting rid of the ones that don't fit is just as important as finding the ones that do. That's an example of how I took the strengths, help them apply it to their own selves and their own uh, interests. Um, and some of them did it at a very surface level. Some of them dove deeply. And, you know, that's just kind of where they were ready to go as well. Awesome. Trisha, do you have any examples? Uh, I do. And I, I love the question because there are always a group of children or big groups of children who might say, oh, Thrively, what do you do there? That's, you know, it's so, you know, quote unquote stupid or it's not, um, it didn't do anything for me. And I think that oftentimes what happens is children don't realize what it is doing for them. Uh, and that's okay, uh, because we as adults know what Judy said is correct. They leave knowing somewhere deep inside that individually and innately, they do come to the table with talents and strengths. And so you have, a, in education, we have this range. We have our at-risk or at-hope kids on the one end. We have our children who are in very, very special classes uh, that we have to protect we have our highest learners in AP Lang classes in eighth grade. And within this big, ginormous spectrum of children, at the end of the day, our goal is that all 1,000 will be proud and happy to know that they have talents and strengths and they're going to take these talents and strengths somewhere. But at the, at the most basic and micro level, you can have a child who came from a different country two years prior uh, went on to Thrively and saw in Thrively that his talents are associated with 20 different career opportunities that are far beyond your traditional doctor, lawyer, engineer, teacher, and uh, pilot. Uh, and then that child might take that talent and deliver the eighth grade commencement speech because he had that talent to be very verbal. And he has a communication talent. And it just so happens that that child, who only came from, the con from a different country two years ago, his very last statement at the promotion speech is, and when you're down and out and you don't know which direction to turn, pull out your strength certificate and see what your talent might be. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really nice to way to send them off. And I wish I had a strength certificate. I, <laughs> I know. Wanna, I don't find out what my strengths are. I don't know. <laughs> so I, for adults, um, Thrively is good from, it's good to take, and there's a bunch of them. And I think we list them on our uh, website, strengthbasededu.com. But there's Thrively, which is sort of more, it's a different 
analytical framework, I don't know what to say otherwise beyond that because I don't know enough, then say what adult ones might be. Mm -hmm. And adult one that both Trish and I have done is um, Strength Finders, Mm -hmm. which is a gallop. And I think you can get, there's a book, Strength Finders, um, or maybe two books. Sometimes it comes with actually the, um, the code to get the assessment, which is about $20. And so from, I did that one and that's very descriptive. And so one of the things that happened to me, um, my number one strength was that I'm a learner. And I have to tell you, I have felt guilty. Like, why am I still taking a class? Why am I signing up for two classes over the summer? Why am I doing stuff? I mean, and then when I realized that was my strength, all of the sort of that guilt about who I am and what propels me was released and it's, and I felt affirmed in like just being who I am and that, 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 that's okay. So I, I think for, as adults, it's really um, grounding whether, whatever kind of assessment you go through, whether it's Myers-Briggs or whatever, that you have some sense of who you are as well, because just like as teachers, when you have that personal experience, then you can go to students and honor their experiences as well. It's just a much better format. VIA is another one. I can't remember what it stands for. That one's free. Well, we'll try and list as many as we yeah. can in our show notes so um, and on our website for our listeners. But yeah, I think I, I, I might be a learner. I actually, <laughs> now that you have just identified yourself. Yeah. Um, How long does this assessment take? So Thrively is about 30 to 35 minutes. The, the Strength Finders is maybe a half an hour, 20 okay. minutes. VIA, I think I've done as well. That one is free. I don't remember what I came out with on that one. The Strength Finders, for me, I think for adults, uh, that's the best one. And it's worth 20 bucks. Um, they have a, like, a more premium thing that you can do. but And they, you get a, a printout about what all those things are. Um, and for me, it was really valid. And as I said, affirming what the other four are. I think strategic, analytical are two of my other ones. What about you, Tricia? What were your strengths? Do you remember? Well, two of mine that turned out being controversial in the sense that I had a very good friend, a dear friend who told me that she didn't ever want to be on a team with me because she she saw me as too competitive or trying to always trying to one up someone which wasn't the case at all. It's just that my talent is that I like to maximize. (laughs) So my talent is maximizer and achiever. It's a very personal and innate thing that just comes out when I'm in a team setting or a group setting. And it was neat to see her validate and tell me face to face uh, when I was on that team with you, when we were doing our doctorate, you know, I, I saw you as such a competitive person, always trying to one up me. And and it had nothing to do with that. It just had to do with the fact that when I see a slide and I might see that uh, there's, you know, there's a spelling error or, you know, a parentheses that might not be the right way. I just want to maximize and achieve the highest potential <laughs> right. I possibly can. Uh, and then, you know, what what's really great is that knowing that about myself, when I'm with someone like Judy, who is constantly maximizing and achieving, it blends so well. So we're able to to build each other up and build one another up and accept each other for those talents. Right. And I I would um, step in here and say, it's really, especially with education moving to more team and collaboration, you know, some of these different personalities have conflicts. Mm -hmm. But I find when I have to, you know, be more successful on our team, that is not a threatening thing. Mm -hmm. That is a positive way of working together. And then also I can, you know, be honest and reflective about, well, this is, this is kind of how I am and this is why I'm that way. And, you know, I can try to adjust and like, what is it that you, what is it you have to offer? Because we need we're better together. Yeah, uh, I'll kind of go back to the nexus of uh, Trisha and I knowing each other. I got a one year gig at her school and she was the established teacher. And I was the last person hired for a 50% job with three different classrooms. And Trisha took the time and desire to collaborate with me as in my one shared class with her, three of them or something. Think about the community of educators, um, sometimes not always welcoming, right? 
in a new school. And so um, like a message to your listeners is to find that person with whom you can collaborate and um, have that simpatico uh, relationship and um, whoever they are, whether it's in your content area or not, you know, that we really need each other. We really need people to work together. And um, I know that I am so much better as a teacher when I have a collaborator with whom I can work because it's not just my ideas or my experiences, but it's a broader, we have to deal with a broader, as you said, spectrum of a group of people. So having deeper understandings of other successes is really important, especially for new teachers. Right. And, and these strengths carry with you for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And so when you go out in the workforce, now all of a sudden you know what your strengths are and how you can help your team and the things that you need to look for in other people as well. To uh, to make a successful team, I think this is awesome. This right. is, I, I can't wait to take this. I know I've got it pulled up right here on my iPad right now. I'm going to take it as soon as we get off the recording. Well, <laughs> well I w- I would think, and this is a recommendation. I don't know what you want to do with your students, your education students, but you know it might be really great for them to have the experience of mm-hmm. doing some strengths assessments and think about how their what their work is like in their groups, you know, and how that the the difference and the combination of strengths, how does that change the work product that they're doing? Mm -hmm. Trisha and I came to a place of trust very quickly. Just, I think we were at a place where we needed each other and wanted to work together and um, we're pretty compatible. So it was very easy. And you had a, some, you had the same goal. Um, I know when I, when I work with some of the high school kids, um, they want to partner up and collaborate with their friends. And I know that, that doesn't, you're not always, those aren't always the best choices. Um, and so I, like my high school senior that just graduated was like, I'd rather just work with people who I know are going to get at least 80% to 90% of it done. And then I can, I, I'll go finish up and tie up all the loose ends. She's the, she's the maximizer, I would say, after listening mm-hmm. <laughs> to That's Trisha. Uh, my daughter would be the one that would kind of put the bow on it and, and uh, make sure that it was, it met all the needs of the rubrics. But, you know, she often in her early career of education would partner with her friends and then end up with an incomplete project or um, because they, they weren't and on disappointment. the disappointment. A, a lot of disappointment, yeah. a lot of frustration because they weren't compatible. They didn't have the same outcomes. They didn't have the same priorities, whatever that is. So, I think had she gone through this experience, maybe in junior high, along with some of her friends, or even kind of going into high school, she, you know, having that knowledge about yourself and being able to articulate that is really powerful. And I I think what, what you guys are doing is giving that to students, you know, as young as fifth grade, maybe even younger, and then helping them build on those strengths and talents, and then helping them articulate that to adults, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to No, go ahead. Um, it definitely changed the way that I did group work, knowing your role in, on a team in adult life, in anything we do. So when my son comes home from school and says, I'm doing a group project, my first question is always, what is your role? Mm -hmm. Are you the chief technology officer of the (laughs) team? Are you the chief creative officer? Are you the social media agent? What's your role? And so, yes. And a lot of times they don't know that. They don't know what their role is. I know that's happened before where they're sort of self-selecting or they're just kind of figuring it out because the teacher doesn't know that they need to establish roles and be very clear. Okay, these are the five roles. There's five of you in the group. Tell me who's doing what. And I've seen that happen so many times where there is just the lack of direction on from the teacher's point. And I've seen it done so amazingly effectively when the like the work product that comes out when the teacher has well-established roles within the group and they've practiced it a few times, maybe in some low stakes type of, maybe an edgy protocol or something like that, where the groups have been established and the roles have been established. The work product that comes out of those projects are usually of higher quality. One of the things you have mentioned, a couple of books that in, in your conversations, but if you can give us any uh, books that have made an impact on you either professionally or personally, we would really appreciate that. So Jennifer Fox has her book, Your Child's Strengths. She's one of the first that I saw mention the strength-based education. I'm um, also looking at some PLC-oriented books by Cassie Erkins, uh, Essential Assessment, Essential Agility. 
And they're really, um, this is part of Solution Tree Press. They're really talking about um, creating an environment of hope. And in that process, there's a focus on strengths as well. The PLC process is one that I've kind of gone deep into in terms of my professional work at my school and my district. But uh, Cassie's work really gets down to be very practical as well. So the, she has three books out. Once I think they're with Nicole uh, Vagel, I think it's the author. They, there are three other authors. At C. Erkins, I think is her um, Twitter handle. Thank you. Pop those on our website. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. Is there any last, uh, anything we didn't ask you that you would like us to ask you or that we didn't cover that you would like us to cover really quickly before we close out? I would, for me, it's just that, um, like, I'm on a journey on this strength-based work. Um, and there's so much I still, we're still learning and we're still uh, delving into um, we're in the newly formed research and design team with Institute for Teaching, where we're kind of trying to do some actual research and identify what the strengths are. And in one of our think tanks, we're working on the possibility of a book and podcasting um, as well on this topic. So I feel like we're in a gestational period this summer um, where I don't have products or things that are like coming out. But I, you know, I think that that's the direction that Trish and I would like to go toward is finding more practical ways to support teachers. And that's been our work as we go along. Just something to add, Trisha? That was perfect. That was awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I learned a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm really <laughs> interested in how I can incorporate some of this into our my master's classes and then just my work with my own children. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't have children anymore. I have adult humans, <laughs> adults. and then I have one child. <laughs> I have to I have to rephrase that now. Um, no, I'm really excited about I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. I, I hope that you guys will come back as you kind of as this evolves and becomes maybe a little more mainstream and talked about. Because uh, you know, in my work in education, this this like I said, this is the first time that I've really heard about it. I think intellectually, you kind of know that this is something that's out there and you go, oh, well, of course I need to. But I but I never had the tools or the um, the resources that you guys have given to us today. So this is going to be a game changer for the teachers that I, that I know I work with. Mm-hmm. So if people want to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Twitter is the best way. Excellent. We'll put those Twitter handles on our in our show notes and on our website. And they can also reach you as out as part of the um, network that you uh, mentioned earlier on that website, if they want you to come and visit their schools if they're in California. Right. Um, and if they're in a fun location like <laughs> New Hawaii. Zealand or Australia or Hawaii, <laughs> I'm sure that you would make uh, an exception. An exception. <laughs> Given the right inducement, we're, we're free to travel. <laughs> uh, awesome. And you guys are both based out of California. That's uh, You yes. said that earlier, Fullerton and uh, Orange County area in California. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I want to just sincerely thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, like I said, we are, you're, we'll definitely invite you back to get more information as, as it comes to you. Please, yes. please keep thank us you, posted thank you. on your work. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Yes, thanks so much. And And we're out. out. Thanks for listening to the My Tech Tool Belt podcast. If you have enjoyed listening, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or send us some feedback on our website, mytechtoolbelt.com. We would love to hear from you. This will help us deliver the content that you want to hear. Thanks. And we're out.